welcome to another episode of Heart to Heart. I am Cindy, your host. Today, I am joined by a very special guest, Ms. Farah Moran, who's had such an exciting career as a, li a licensed clinical social worker. Farah, a remarkable individual who has dedicated her entire career to the noble cause of helping patients grow, heal, and navigate through challenging and difficult situations. Today, we'll delve into Farah's fascinating journey, her experiences as a licensed clinical social worker, and her profound impact she has made in the lives of her patients. Uh, so without further ado, let's welcome Farah to the podcast and hear her inspiring story. So Farah, welcome. Thank you so much, Cindy. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. And I really admire the work that you are doing. So thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you. I am so honored that you are here, that you're taking the time to come to the podcast and share your amazing work, your amazing story. So I want to start off with your journey, uh, your remarkable journey. Um, can you share a little bit about, you know, your journey to becoming a licensed clinical social worker? What inspired you to pursue a career in this field? Oh, my good Lord, my journey. Where do I start? Uh, as you know, Cindy, I was born and raised in the countryside of Haiti. Um, growing up, I um, used to hold community meetings or Bible study in my neighborhood and all the kids will just come and I will take whatever I could find in my parents' pantry and, you know, as snacks. And of wow. course, where, where there's snacks, kids will gather, right? And we all will have wow. such a good time and playing and uh, worshiping together. And um, over the years, you know, um, I left Haiti when I was about 15, 16, and the group grew so much. And when I came here to the United States and I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do for a career um, and during a career fair and I met someone who talks about psychology and social work and the type of work they do and how they can make an impact in the community. And coming here as well as refugee, there was a social worker, and I remember her name until this day. She was our resettler. So she helped us transition from Haiti to here. And the work that she was doing was just so remarkable. And, and I asked her what she did, and she said, I'm a social worker. And I was like, oh my gosh, I want to be like you. <laughs> and so um, little did I know, and I went to school, I majored in psychology in undergrad. And uh, in graduate school, I decided to uh, obtain my master in social work. And over the years, uh, it's been over 17 years, Cindy, and I've done quite a bit of work in different sectors. Um, but for the first few years in my career, I worked as a case manager. And I did that solely to give back what Mona did for us when we moved here. Uh, and so that allowed me the opportunity to, to give back into the community uh, and just to continue to spread love and care and kindness uh, that I myself received. Oh, wow. So incredible. I love the fact that you, you actually enter into this field in order to also give back, you know, what you've received. That's, that's incredible. Um, so a lot of times we hear about, you know, we know the title license, clinical social worker. Um, you hear it a lot, but a lot of times we don't really understand what the job entails, <laughs> what, what it is, you know, what are the responsibilities. And so today I want to take the opportunity to just um, have you talk a little bit about, uh, give us some specific examples of the issues or challenges that you typically assist your patients with. Well, you are absolutely right, Cindy. Social work is a very wide open field. Uh, yeah. There are various different specialties. I am a licensed clinical so, uh, psychotherapist in the state of Florida. Uh, so I have three specializations. There are substance use disorder, trauma, and couples and family system therapy. Uh, so I provide psychotherapy services to children all the way up to adult. And I see individuals for a variety of different reasons. 
uh, that do not necessarily fall within one specific box, you know, but that include conditions like stress and anxiety, depression, uh, traumatic incidents, um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Many individuals after um, experiencing a very um, traumatic event, such as, uh, you know, natural disasters, um, political climate, uh, believe it or not, can contribute to uh, traumatic incidences, um, immigration issues, uh, school shootings. So those are some uh, issues that I see children for and individuals with substance use disorder or substance misuse, uh, marital and relationship problems, family problems, acculturations, grief, and a host of other psychological conditions. Wow. So you said that you provide services from children to adults. Can you give us a, an age range? I see children as early as, as young as five years old, all the way up to hundreds. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that you clarified that. And, you know, you, you have an area, the specific area that you, you service clients for. So I'm glad you, you clarified that. And you talked about, you talked about, you know, clients having stress, anxiety, and depression, um, I think stress is probably one of the the link to anxiety and depression. Um, you know, I've, you know, I've heard that stress leads to anxiety, anxiety leads leads to depression. So I, I'm glad that you're here, so you can talk to us about that. Um, you know, I, I'm not a professional, but that's that's what I've heard. So, can you tell us, um, explain the relationship between stress, anxiety, and depression? and how one can potentially lead to another. Absolutely, there is a close linkage and many times psychological conditions coexist. Um, stress is the physical or mental response uh, to an external cause. And mm -hmm. so a stressor may be a one-time or short-term occurrence, or it can happen repeatedly uh, over mm -hmm. a long period of time. Uh, so. It goes, stress typically goes away once the situation resolves itself. Uh, so as uh, you know, stress can be negative or positive. There are some positive stress, like having a baby, for instance, can be a positive stress, graduating college or going to school, although the process can be stressful, but those are considered as positive stress. Uh, so also stress can motivate you to to, for instance, to meet a deadline or it may cause you to lose sleep. So that's the positive and negative correlation here with stress. Anxiety, on the other hand, Cindy, um, is your body's reaction to stress. And it can occur even when there is no current threat. So anxiety can exist in the absence of stress, um, but stress typically can exist um, independently of anxiety. And it usually involves a persistent feeling of apprehension or dread that does not go away uh, and that typically interferes with how you live your life. Mm. And so both stress and anxiety can affect the mind and the body. And so if anxiety doesn't go away and it begins to interfere with your life, it could affect your health. And you could experience problem with your immune system, digestive system, cardiovascular, or reproductive system. Yes, reproductive system. Oh, wow. And subsequently, that puts an individual at a higher risk to develop uh, a condition such, such as um, depression or other um, depressive disorders. Oh. Wow, I'm I'm glad that you really explained that because um, a lot of time things are happening in our bodies and we, we don't know what that is, but it could be, you know, linked to stress or, you know, and you, you mentioned, you said something about good stress. There is good stress and bad stress. I, I, I have a hard time. <laughs> I have a hard time understanding it. Stress is stress. I'm stressed out. But, Okay. Um, but so, when you, you know, I, I'm glad you said that, Cindy. Some, a lot of time we are having a hard time differentiate because stress is stress. Whether it's a good stress or bad stress, it affects the body the same. 
So there's no difference. The difference is for you to recognize why my stress, what is the source of my stress. And so this way you can um, find out what coping mechanisms will work for you based on the source of the stress. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm glad you said that. Um, because um, the next question, actually, we're going to talk about uh, stress management, you know, um, mm -hmm. as it is crucial uh, for maintaining good mental health. Um, and I know a lot of people, people are going through a lot. People are finding themselves in stressful situations and mm -hmm. um, end up in depression and, and maybe turning to they're turning to drugs or they're turning to, um, to alcohol to cope with, you know, anxiety and, you know, depression. So, um, uh, Farah, can you, what are some of the practical, uh, and effective ways that individuals can take care of their stress on a daily basis? That's a very good question, Cindy. I'm a very big advocate for self care. Oh, yeah. Self-care yeah. is important. And as I previously mentioned, um, the number one thing is to identify the source of your stress. Mm -hmm. um, so once you identify the root of the stress, then begin to uh, formulate a plan and engage in activities that, that are meaningful to you, that brings you pleasure. Uh, things like uh, ensure that individuals exercise and, and eat healthy and regular meals. Um, stick to a sleep routine. Sleep is very important. We need eight to 10 hours of sleep. And, and nowadays, whether it's adult or children, uh, social media can be a huge barrier to obtaining that uh, amount of sleep that is needed for proper functioning. So ensuring that you have a routine and you are getting enough sleep is very important. And avoid drinking excessive caffeine or you know things like soft drink or coffee um, avoid drinking excessive alcohol or illicit drugs um, and identifying and challenge your negative and un unhelpful thoughts because many times our stress and anxiety comes from maladaptive thinking and so if we can change the way we think about a situation and subsequently, that changes the way we feel about the situation and also the way we behave about the situation. So the, re the reason why I'm bringing up behavior here, Cindy, is because when we stress, we tend to engage in maladaptive coping mechanisms. There mm. are coping mechanisms nevertheless, but they may be negative. Overeating, drinking a lot, those are negative coping mechanisms, even though they are um, serve a purpose short term uh, and reach out to friends and family. It's important that we stay connected. We are a relational being. We yeah. were created to be in relationship with one another, to be in harmony. And so we are not meant to be in isolation. So reach out to friends and family members uh, when you are in need and recognize that need and don't be ashamed to ask for help. Yeah. Wow. Oh my goodness, you just gave tons of good nuggets. Um, but the one thing I'm like, I'm not a coffee drinker, <laughs> not so ever, but you said not too much caffeine. What about the people who go, they can't go a day without a cup of coffee? Like, <laughs> Well, you know, so, everything, everything in moderation. That's right everything in moderation in the end. So you can have that coffee if your body needs it, but it's how much of it you drink, that's the problem. And so self-control is important. Wow, very good, that's very good. Everybody, you hear that? Everything in moderation, including coffee. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, so I'm, so I'm excited. We're gonna talk about postpartum. Um, oh. My goodness, uh, I'm, I'm going back to those days because, you know, I shared with you that um, I was in passport and I didn't even know it. Like, I didn't know what it was. Um, I will go to the doctor's office. Um, I'll take my child to take my child to get checked up. And, you know, they give you this questionnaires and they ask you about postpartum. They ask you about depression. And I'm just checking. Oh, no, no. And a lot of times we don't know, you know, they don't tell you why you need to know about those things. They don't tell you why it's 
important to to know how you feel, you know, after having a child, after giving birth to a child. And I know postpartum is a vast and multifaceted subject. Um, and and uh, postpartum depression is significant. It's a significant concern um, for many new mothers, you know, as we know it. Uh, can you shed some light on the symptoms um, of postpartum risk factors and effective treatment options? Well, of course. Uh, you know, Cindy, having a baby mm. is a life-changing experience. Mm. And being a parent is exciting, mm. but can also be tiring and overwhelming. And so it's normal to have feelings of worry or doubts as a new parent, especially if you are a first time parent. Mm. Postpartum depression typically occurs after birth, mm. but postpartum depression doesn't just affect the birthing person. It can also affect surrogate parents and adoptive parents. And those individuals experience similar stressors, such as hormonal imbalance after giving birth, mm -hmm. uh, physical changes, emotional changes, financial challenges in some cases for some individuals, and social changes after having a baby, whether it's giving birth or adopting a child. So these changes can cause symptoms of postpartum depression. There is a difference mm -hmm. Sometimes after giving birth, as I said, some feelings are normal. We mm. have what they call baby blues. Some yeah. individuals experience baby blues where you just feel, you know, a little malaise and not really up to doing a whole lot of things, but those don't last. This is a very temporary adjustment. But postpartum depression, if untreated, it may last for months or longer. And mm. research really showed that, Cindy, um, those who develop postpartum depression are at higher or at a greater risk to developing a major depression or major depressive disorder later on in life. So early intervention is key. And so after giving birth or adopted a child, if anyone is experiencing you know, extreme sadness um, or loneliness, severe mood swings, um, hmm. With crying, uh, crying spells, insomnia, loss of appetite, and difficulty bonding with the baby, which is the number one mm. predictor of uh, postpartum depression, difficulty bonding with the baby, then that person may be suffering from, this, from postpartum depression. So if that happens, see a professional. Treatment mm. can include counseling services, antidepressant for those who believe in can accept medication and hormone therapy. Uh, those are the three most common modalities to treat postpartum depression. Wow. Wow. Very good nuggets. Very good information. Um, uh, as we know in July is national minority health, mental health awareness. Um, you and I have talked about this before, but I want you to really take your time uh, going into <laughs> this. Yeah, I, I, I really want people to know about this and be, you know, we bring in awareness, of course. Um, so how do you address the unique mental health challenges faced for minority, uh, by minority communities? Um, and I know you have a private practice, right? <laughs> in your private practice. And how can we work to break the, the stigmas um, uh, that surround me mental health uh, in minority communities? What a great question, Cindy, yes. Uh, and you know, actually, m July has been designated as Minority Mental Health Month by a social mm -hmm. worker and by an African-American social worker. Um, so it's significant that, you know, we take care of ourselves and everybody take care of themselves. But there are if, uh, many, many factors that really affect access to mental health services for minorities. Um, mm. And some of which, Cindy, can include socioeconomic status, um, lack of social support, 
discrimination uh, significantly can influence access and utilization of mental health services. Um, because of the fact that discrimination and racism can result in internalization and distrust of systems mm -hmm. and specifically the medical system, which usually attach with mental health systems mm -hmm. as well. Um, and again, those mistrust may be grounded in historical trauma experienced mm -hmm. by minority groups um, and so those traumatic events prevent them from access services. Cultural belief is another factor that influences access to mental health for many minority communities um, because many minoritized groups believe that conditions such as depression and anxiety are to be treated with willpower and mm -hmm. prayer only and keep it in the family. And of course, we know the power of prayer. There's nothing that's impossible, right? Mm -hmm. But we also know that God created resources using mm -hmm. us here on earth as vessels uh, mm -hmm. to continue his mission. And so we'll, prayer alone may not necessarily be able to address certain conditions. Um, mm -hmm. So to mitigate, to mitigate uh, health disparities, um, it is important that we address the social factors first mm -hmm. that, that influence uh, the lack of access. You know, some of those social factors, again, as I previously mentioned, including income, education, and social support, and improving overall community health. So if we can start from the ground, then we can build a very strong foundation. We must do those things first. Uh, and, and many every state have their own uh, legislative uh, or policies uh, surrounding healthcare, uh, and so if we can begin at the very least to make healthcare accessible to everyone, then they can access services a lot easier. And um, you know, on a personal level, for, you know, for example, if you need help, mm. I say ask. For as for me in my private practice, to go back to your answer and how we yeah. serve my monetized population here, um, I offer uh, three free sessions per year. So I'm able to serve three individuals who either don't have insurance or don't have sufficient insurance. Or what I mean by sufficient insurance, sometimes individuals have an insurance policy but their deductible is five, six thousand dollars before the insurance will pay anything, right? So it's it's like they don't have insurance. And right. so because you have to come up with five thousand dollars out of pocket first. So in those cases, uh, to have those individuals access services, I will see those three individuals per year for free of charge. Oh my goodness. Um talking about how can we um as a society you know, break those stigmas. I, I believe what you're doing is amazing. You know, you're starting with what you have, you know, mm -hmm. although uh, they may not have enough access or legislation or uh, things that support, you know, what you just talked about. But what, what you're doing right now, you're starting in your own practice, you know, with what, what you have, giving those three. Um, do you do it for, for how, how long do you do it for? I provide the service for as long as they need it. Uh, and so it could be for some individuals, as I said before, it could just be an adjustment and they just need the support for a month or two or three, and that's it. And for others, it may be a couple of years that they still need the support, but as long as they are accepted, uh, it's been determined that they need the service and they are unable to afford the service elsewhere or they or to pay me to afford my services. And so I will provide the service to them. I consider myself a servant. And so yeah. I become a social worker to serve. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, Cindy, I feel a very strong conviction to give back wherever there's a need. I love that. I, I love that. And I want everyone to know about your practice. Like, can you tell us a little bit about it or anything more that you want to add concerning your private um, practice? Um, again, I'm in private practice. I, I am a fee for service. 
uh, mm -hmm. practitioner. So I accept two insurances only. I accept Medicare and Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And I am licensed in the state of Florida. And I know that you are in Illinois, correct? Yes. Yes. And so, but if anybody find themselves in the Southwest Florida region, um, uh, I will be happy to service them if they are in need. I also um, provide consultation and professional development. So for those two services, they do not necessarily have to be in Florida because mm -hmm. it doesn't require me to be in the state of Florida to provide educational services. So uh, I can travel for those services. If somebody have, you know, a corporate event, they'd like to provide training for their employees, such as, you know, things around cultural competency or sexual harassment or how to get along, uh, you know, conflict resolution, uh, some, any topic around those uh, subjects that uh, I can certainly travel for and provide staff development. Wow. Brilliant. That, that's excellent. Um... Very good. Thank you for sharing that. So you also specialize um, in couples therapy, which I'm very excited uh, to. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> couples therapy, um, how can couples, regardless of their cultural background, I know I, I say cultural background because um, I, 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 I'm using my own example. For instance, uh, you know, my husband and I have, you know, different backgrounds, of course. You know, mm -hmm. he's, ori he's originally from Jamaica and, you know, I grew up in the Congo. And so, but we, we had cultural differences, of course. But what we found out is that we had a lot in common. We had a lot in common. And, um, and it's always interesting to find out about the other person's culture so I feel like, you know, I, I always want to find out, hey, how do you guys do this? <laughs> and, and he's always <laughs> want to find out, how do you guys do this on this side? And I find it, it I find it that it's a really good balance. It's a really good balance, which sometimes it doesn't work that way. Right. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. So anyways, that's just for me. I, I put it there. That was my personal question. Um, um, regardless, their cultural backgrounds. Uh, improve communication, how can couples improve communication, um, understanding and emotional intimacy um, mm -hmm. in the relationship? You know, the the act of marriage, Cindy, I've been married 19 years, it's going to be 20 in August, good Lord gracious. The congratulations. Act of marriage, I'm sorry? I said congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, the act of marriage is such a beautiful, beautiful thing. Right. Mm -hmm. But a marriage can become sterile, mm -hmm. distant and unfulfilled. And on the other hand, a marriage can have strong emotional intimacy mm -hmm. that can create a positive energy and deepening the connection between the two individuals. Yeah. But a marriage requires five pillars that I consider in my opinion that really create the, the strong foundation for marriage. Those five mm. pillars are, I call them communication, mm. respect, trust, love, and commitment. Mm. And so I, I, I kind of like create a little acronym for it to, to help people remember it easier and I call it CRTLC. So we need a little TLC. So the end there is TLC. And so that. the communications and the most occur often and not just mm. superficial communication. Because many times when individuals have been married for a long time, they begin to communicate very superficially and transactionally, communicate mm. things about the kids, you know, the kids' schedule. Uh, but the communication has to be a two-way dialogue and it requires active listening. Mm -hmm. And the second pillar here is respect. Respect each other's opinions, choices, understand and respect each other's love mm -hmm. and love language. And so those are important. Trust, allow yourself to be vulnerable with each other. 
Um, be honest with your feelings, uh, with your thoughts. And, and when those feelings and thoughts are shared, don't use them against each other. And don't use their weaknesses against them because that will break the trust that can help to build that strong emotional bond. Um, mm. Love, love one another as Christ called us to do so, right? Yeah. Christ called us to love our spouses, to model after him. And that mm. love requires, again, remember what I said earlier, a two-way dialogue. It requires submission, mm. the denial of self. And when I talk about the denial of self, uh, you know, from a biblical perspective, and individual, when I, I said earlier, I'm a very big advocate for self-care, right? Mm. And, and people will say, well, why are you telling me to deny myself mm. when I need to take care of myself? That's not what that means at all. You mm. still need to take good care of yourself individually mm. and together. But if you deny yourself and you allow yourself to be fully of service and available mm. for your partner, and if your partner does the same, it equals out, it balances. So it cannot be a one way. It has to be a two way thing. And the commitment really is being fully committed to the growth of the relationship. And so to improve communication, you know, understanding and emotional intimacy, I will encourage individuals to try the following tips. Mm. Um, try not to put too much there because uh, I don't want to <laughs> overwhelm you guys, uh, but- No, that's good information. Oh, number one thing is to validate it. Validate mm. your partner's feelings. It mm. doesn't matter how silly it may be or it may seem to you, but it is real to them. If mm. they take the risk and share with you, validate it. And that's where I that's that's where the vulnerability comes in that I shared earlier. Allow yourself mm. to be vulnerable. Give your partner affirmation and compliments. We are we oftentimes so focus on the mis mistakes on the little things that are not done mm. but we the little things that are done mm. so give compliments and don't try this one is a big one don't try to fix their problems mm. when when I first got married that was one of the biggest problems between my husband and I I felt as if I couldn't communicate anything to him because whenever I say something, he sprung into action. He tried to fix it. Mm. I'm like, no, that's not what I need. That's not what I want. I just want you to listen. I need you to fix that's it. Right. So don't try to fix each other's problems. <laughs> wow. And this one is another big one. Many couples or individuals, especially from, I guess, in the Christian sector, we don't talk about this enough. And, mm. and I refuse not to not talk about it. This is like a double negative there, not to not to is, talk about yeah. it. <laughs> um, and that, that one, Cindy, is to prioritize sexual satisfaction. Mm. What does that mean for you as a couple? Find out what that is and prioritize that and make an effort to break out of your day-to-day -day routine. Be spontaneous, mm. have a pump to date night, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, and don't stop doing the little things that you used to do for each other at the beginning mm. of your relationships. It could be a simple thing as writing a little note or you know, sending a text nowadays, not note anymore, right? Wow. And those little things can go a long way because that shows something John Gottman whom I was trained mm. under and who was the pioneer in marital uh, therapy or marital counseling. He has a wealth of information out there. He's like a wonderful uh, training institute that you can gather information from. He calls that fondness and admiration. Mm. Whenever a relationship don't have fondness and admiration, mm. it begins. That's right. Uh, and so, again, when I meet couples, one of the first thing I ask them, what do you like about John? And many times they find a thousand things they like about each other, despite that they are fighting and they are, they're on the verge of getting a divorce. 
but they can still find that fondness and admiration. Now there's hope. When they can't find a single thing about that person, mm. now we are in trouble. And yeah, I mean, last one, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, I said now, yeah, I agree with you. It's trouble <laughs> when you can't find any good thing in your partner. Yeah, that's trouble. Oh, yes, goodness. and so last but not least about uh, marriage is to practice physical intimacy. Uh, again, earlier I talked about, you know, prioritizing uh, sexual intimacy. This one is physical intimacy. It's very, very oh. important. And that physical oh. intimacy may be simple as uh, taking a shower together or mm-hmm. offer a back massage. And, and don't do these things in order to signal your partner that you want sex, but mm-hmm. rather to express rather to express your affection and to increase that emotional intimacy. You know, mm. a shoulder rub, a back rub, uh, making your tea, you, you just do it as an act of kindness to build that intimacy. I think, I think there, women do it for, as an act of kindness, but men do it for some <laughs> And so this applies to women and men, you know, do those things to improve your intimacy. <laughs> they need to hear it. Just be kind. Just be kind. That's all. <laughs> don't, don't I'm rub my in return. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Okay, continue. <laughs> Oh, my good Lord. And yeah, like, uh, again, to end here, Cindy, is to put each other first. Mm. If you put each other first, mm. your marriage or your relationship will flourish. But when you put yourself first, there's only so far you can go. Wow. Amazing. So communication, communication, respect, commitment, mm-hmm. love. Mm-hmm. What, what are the other two? Trust. Okay, love and trust. Wow. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. That love that's powerful. Trust. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Um, so, what message would you like to? I know a lot of people will be watching and listening to this episode. Um, what last message do you have regarding uh, mental health awareness and? the importance of self-care. And I, I know you mentioned it um, a lot of times, but what, what last message do you have for our viewers and listeners? Be kind and compassionate to yourself. You cannot, you cannot be available physically, psychologically, or emotionally to anyone if you are not well yourself. Wow. So take care of yourself first so that you can be available for your family, for your loved ones. Take good care of yourself and mm-hmm. don't be afraid to seek help. Um, we all fall on a spectrum that I call it. It's mm-hmm. a matter of time where today you may be here on that spectrum. The next day you may be here. So seeking help is not a weakness. It's a sign mm. of strength rather than a weakness because when you can recognize your needs and you attend to your needs, that mm. is great strength. It's not a weakness. So it's okay to not be okay. That's right. And it's okay yeah. to seek help. You have your own practice. Um, where can people learn more about your services? How can people get in touch with you? Are you on social media? Uh, Do you have a website where people can go and just, you know, know more about your private practices, your services? Of course. Thank you for that, Cindy. Um, For my private practice, I can be reached at www.moramcounselingservices, all one word, dot com, moramcounselingservices.com, or 239 264-3102, 2-3-9-2-6-4-3-1-0-2. I do work for an organization as well, but I did not get their permission to, um, to share 
for the uh, for this podcast tonight. But just general information: if anyone happens to be in the Southwest Florida region, check out Healthcare Network. Mm. Healthcare Network is a federally qualified health center that is home for medical, dental, behavior, uh, and psychological and mental health services. So it's a one-stop shop where you can get everything under one roof. And so check it out and you can find more information about Healthcare Network at healthcareswfl.org. That is mm-hmm. healthcarestarfwestflorida.org. Uh, again, they provide the full continuum of care from medical, behavioral, mental, and dental care. Wow. Are they all over the U.S., the United they States? Are only in Florida. Only Florida, yeah. But okay. they are part of the federally qualified health center that are all over the U.S. It's just healthcare network is in Florida, but mm-hmm. FQHCs are embedded in almost every city in the United States. Wow. Farah, Moram, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I mean, you, you came and delivered so many great nuggets and i know you know this episode is really going to help people it's really going to help folks and um i just want to thank you for your time and for you saying yes to my invitation so thank you so much it is a pleasure cindy again thank you for having me uh, it is such a pleasure and i really love the work that you are doing uh, i really support you it's so inspiring and uh, it is such a pleasure to be part, and uh, I'm, I really am honored to be here. And, and thank you so much for having me. Thank you.